Hello and welcome to another very entertaining video. In our last video, we talked about proprioception and specifically we focused on the muscle spindle and how it can relay information, specifically velocity, muscle stretch, the length of the muscle, how we can relay this information to the brain to help the brain know where the muscle is in three-dimensional space at any given time. In this, video, in this video, I'd like to highlight an application of that information to show how reflexes can protect the muscle from damage. The classic reflex, reflex is the stretch reflex, also sometimes referred to as the muscle spindle reflex or the knee jerk reflex. Now let's consider what's going on. Here we'll draw a femur, and of course this is attached at the knee to the tibia and fibula. There's my foot. When you're sitting on a table and you get whacked in the patellar tendon, why does that cause your knee, your foot, to jerk out and kick? Well, if we look at the quadriceps muscle group, this is a large muscle group on the ventral side of the femur, and if we follow it to its insertion point, we're going to go through the patellar tendon. So here's the patella or the kneecap, and that's going to come down and it's going to attach down here on the tibia. So this is when the physician gets out his hammer and strikes right here at the patellar tendon. Now, what effect is that gonna have on the muscle? Well, I hope you can appreciate that as we depress the patellar tendon, that's gonna lead to a slight stretch of the quadriceps muscle group as the muscle is pulled forward toward this depression. Now, from our last video looking at stretch receptors, I hope you can appreciate increased stretch is going to lead to increased frequency of action potentials. So if we follow that action potential through the afferent signal coming from the muscle spindle, a couple of things to remember. First and foremost, all sensory goes through the dorsal horn. If you recall from a previous unit, general sensory afferents are unipolar neurons. Right here, right before we enter the spinal cord, this is where a collection of the cell bodies are. And this is called the dorsal root ganglia. And of course, this is the dorsal side, and this would be the ventral side of the spinal cord. Now, as we discussed previously, we know that this is going to synapse, and it's going to send a signal up to the brain, relaying that stretch information. But reflexes don't require input from the brain. The reflex happens spontaneously, independent of anything that the brain does. And the stretch reflex is specifically designed to protect this muscle by, as it senses a little bit of stretch, it wants to flex in order to protect it. So, the alpha motor neuron and our motor comes from the ventral horn of the spinal cord, so we'll start here, exit ventrally, and come up to the agonist muscle. All we have to do now is connect the circuit. So if we zoom in, what we see, this is what we refer to as a monosynaptic reflex. And we will see the sensory afferent extend down and synapse directly onto that lower motor neuron, delivering an EPSP, or an excitatory postsynaptic potential to that lower motor neuron, causing it to stimulate the muscle to flex. This is the simplest of all reflexes because it is monosynaptic. Now let's look at a couple of different types of reflexes built to deal with different conditions. The second reflex is called the Golgi tendon organ reflex or the GTO reflex. Very similar to the muscle spindle, the GTO is also a stretch receptor, but the difference is this. The Golgi tendon organ, like the name implies, is not found in the muscle proper, but actually found in the tendon. Now, what's it going to take to stretch the tendon? Well, a little hammer in the doctor's office isn't going to do it. But let's say this individual is doing knee extensions in the gym and has chosen a lot of weight. Well, under tremendous pressure and load, I hope you can appreciate that the tendon will start to stretch as the muscle exerting maximum strength to keep this heavy weight suspended pulls on those tendons. So that's the difference compared to the muscle spindle reflex where it was a muscle stretching. Here, the muscle may or may not be stretching. It might be completely isometric. But because of the heavy weight of the load, the tendon is stretching. This leads to stretch of the Golgi tendon organ. And similar to above, we've got an increased frequency of action potentials in the afferent sensory neuron. However, I hope you can appreciate, we don't want to deliver an EPSP to the agonist muscle in this case. We're already under tremendous stress, and if we reflexively tried to flex the muscle more, we'd likely pull the tendon right off the bone. At a minimum, we'd have a muscle tear and do damage. And so this reflex is just the opposite in the sense that I want to make sure 
that the agonist muscle receives an IPSP, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Now, how does that happen? Because up here, my afferent is delivering an EPSP, and it can't change the neurotransmitter that it's going to exocytose at the end of this action potential. So how can I convert an EPSP to an IPSP? Well, for that, I need an interneuron. So let's zoom into the spinal cord and see what happens here. In this scenario, the afferent sensory neuron synapses on an interneuron. And by stimulating an action potential in the interneuron, that neuron can deliver then either a GAB or glycine neurotransmitter, which is going to lead to an IPSP, resulting in this muscle, my agonist muscle, relaxing. So if you ever hear of weightlifters, their muscles give out on them, this is what's going on. It's stimulation of the GTO reflex as a safety mechanism because the low was so heavy. All right, there are two more reflexes that we want to discuss, and these two are intimately related with each other. The first one is the withdrawal reflex. A couple of things that I want to highlight that are different compared to the others. First of all, the withdrawal reflex is not based on proprioception. Rather, the withdrawal reflex is based on pain. And the receptor that we have for pain is called a nociceptor. So let's imagine walking down the street, and you happen to step on a board that's got a nail in it. Well, the withdrawal reflex is all about reversing the motions that cause you to put weight on that foot. So while it would be difficult to say, you know, this is the agonist muscle and this is the antagonist muscle, we can roughly say, again, that for whatever motion it is, we have agonist muscles producing the motion, and we have antagonists that are opposing the agonist muscles. Well, how does this reflex work? As pain is registered, again, all sensory is going to travel through afferents that are going through the dorsal horn. Here we see the dorsal root ganglia. And then we exit the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. I want you to focus just for now on the ipsilateral side and see what's happening. Here the message is delivered to two inner neurons, each one of them connected to lower motor neurons, one going to the antagonist muscle group and the other going to the agonist muscle group. Think for just a second about what you would like to deliver, an EPSP or an IPSP to these muscle groups. Because the agonist muscle group is the group that's extending pressure on the foot, pushing the foot down on the nail, we want to reverse that. And so we're going to send inhibitory IPSPs to the agonist muscle group. And the withdrawal reflex is the perfect example of reciprocal innervation, where we send EPSPs to the, agon to the antagonist muscle group, reversing the motion so that I quickly withdraw my foot from the nail. Now, the consequence of that motion is my foot is not going to the ground, and now we see the purpose of the crossed extensor reflex. So at the same time I'm withdrawing the foot that just stepped on the nail, I also need to put my opposite foot down so that I can catch myself and not fall. Again, we have the same muscle groups over here that we'll define as agonist and antagonist. We have our lower motor neurons, and this again is all driven by the sensory input from the nociceptor that is delivering this message, the crossed extensor reflex is just opposite to what we saw on the ipsilateral side. So on the contralateral side, we see the agonist muscle groups receiving the EPSP and the antagonist muscle groups receiving the IPSP. In this way, I'm able to withdraw one foot to avoid the pain but also to put down the other foot so that I can restore balance and not fall on my face. That's how the withdrawal reflex and the crossed extensor reflex are related.